Hello, and welcome to Cosmic Dream Sanctuary. Uh, in a moment, I will read to you an illustrated book I wrote um, called Unrealizing Divine Identity. This is a book all about how to realize your true nature as divine, your true nature as perhaps a cosmic dreamer, having a dream of this cosmos, of realizing who you are. And so this has a series of instructions, some meditations, some thoughts and feelings. The way this will work, uh, since it is an illustrated book, is that I'll read it to you, and I will describe the illustrations as they come up. So for those who are tuning in to audio formats, you're more than welcome to continue tuning into audio formats because I'll describe the text. And if you're tuning in to uh, here using a video format, uh, just simply use my descriptions of the imagery as a way to deepen your uh, exploration. All of the images, all of this text is offered as a mirror to you of your own divine nature. So it's not so much of a communication from me to you as something more like an art, as art or an artistic expression helps you realize or encounter your own experience. <clears throat> so with that, um, I invite you to realize your own identity as divine, on realizing divine identity. Introduction. Emergent phenomena are logically and causally prior to perception, theory, and belief. Raw, primal experience is necessary for intellectual activity. Form must have content. Expectation of the everyday determines mundane experience. Theory and belief mold perception from the clay of primal experience. Form is the limitation of content. Emerged phenomena are dependent on theory, belief, and bias. God formed the primal human from clay, but vivified it with his breath. The embrace of form and content births evolution, the history of transcendence. We are more than we appear. Experience is never mundane. The passing of time reveals perception's illusion. We are more than we appear because we have forgotten who we are. Self-perception limits the phenomena of self. Materialistic theory causes the appearance of spirit to be ignored and de denies our divine self. Theistic belief causes the appearance of spirit to be outside of space-time and de denies divinity in the everyday. We exist in a prison of perception, of the self, built by the self. Perception limits phenomena, which in turn defines perception. Everyday experience is a closed system, feeding upon the memory of primal experience. Goal. The process of identification with divinity is simple, straightforward, and a stepwise process that must occur on all levels of the self. While the whole being becomes engaged, most of the action must occur in the intellectual and egoistic self. The intellectual ego observes phenomena, develops perception-shaping theory, and determines the volition. Development on all levels above and below this level, such as through dreaming or religious devotion, must eventually achieve resonance with the ego through roundabout means that drain the developmental motion of its initial energy. In contrast, development on the egoistic level simply consists in allowing phenomena to emerge without strong limitations by perception and in turn allow new primal experiences to transform the self. This path utilizes activities and energies familiar to the everyday, simply rearranging volition, observation, and activity in order to invite the cosmic process of creative evolution to occur within the self. Step by step, the ego meets its own limitations in primal experience, dies to ignorance, and is reborn enlightened, compassionate, and beautiful. So here we have an illustration. It's an abstract illustration. It is a wide rectangle, um, and there is a sense of uh, things moving, 
a sense of revealing different dimensions, densities, uh, patterning of light and dark, uh, centrality to the, the bottom center of this illustration. <laughs> Purpose. This little book is a collection of ideas, tools, practices, and maps to be used by the everyday self in order to step towards identification with divinity, with the true self. I have gathered them along my way, and their assemblage now represents a whole. I offer them in a simple and short expression as a guidebook for the beginner to be picked up when one cannot find a way out of the prison of self and to be discarded before this first step out. They are means to an end and must be vivified with pure motivation. In themselves, they are not presented as true, youth, useful, or beautiful. Truth, beauty, and utility exist as an experience in the emergent phenomenon. Judge th them not in the book, but rather in the heart and mind in practice. Your motivation will determine their effectiveness. And here we have an image of a figure in the left-hand side of a short rectangle that is standing on a road, on a hill, at uh, the road goes through forest and it leads to town that's besides an ocean and there is a bright sun shining sun uh, to the right at the same level actually as the uh, figure figure's face and he is covering his eyes to sort of look out in the distance and back to the text motivation the spiritual world is full of exotic places and persons exciting and attractive to one trapped in physical matter. It is a world of danger as well as beauty, inhabited by angelic creatures as well as demonic primitive forces. Our prison is one of perception, not matter. Use of this collection to simply expand perception without the necessary identification with emergent phenomenon will be at least an expansion of the prison and perhaps a large step toward danger. However, excuse me, Practice with impure motivation is an invitation to the darker forces. However, when they are used as a vehicle for identification with divinity, they are effective and exotic spiritual phenomena will emerge as a matter of fact. The motivation to identify with the divine takes as many forms as there are beings. One may simply seek greater truth and knowledge to manifest greater beauty or compassion, enlightenment for oneself or others, to be free of ignorance, or simply to continue personal development and growth. Every being has a purpose, every being divine. So in this illustration, we have a human figure surrounded by this sort of vortex energy that seems to open up the space to reveal a sun above him that's radiating to the left of the figure is a tree that has no leaves, and to the right there is a tree full of leaves. Back to the text. Ideas. Introduction. Ideas and beliefs are the easiest means for the expansion of consciousness. They are the foundation of perception, and they limit the emergence of phenomena. Clairvoyants see spirits, but those who don't believe in the possibility rarely see them. If you believe that all phenomena are reducible to their physical components, then spiritual development must take place solely through morality and not through spirit. The power of ideas on the path is twofold. First, certain ideas stop perception from automatically limiting phenomena. For example, the idea that science progresses through observation and paradigm revolution will prevent materialistic dogma from cutting off paranormal events in consciousness. Second, certain ideas encourage novel experiences and the expansion of perception. For example, the idea that events unfold according to ka karmic laws may reveal a realm of previously unknown causes. The idea that the self exists on more levels than the physical admits the possibility of spiritual communication. The illustration here is an eyeball, and in the pupil there is the word idea, and underneath that is theory, idea and theory. Back to the text about the self, recollection. The soul once existed in a world of knowledge. When the soul entered the body, it forgot its knowledge and true nature. It begins life in illusion. 
Knowledge, beauty, and compassion are acts of recollecting the true nature. The self uses recollection as a vehicle to travel from illusion to reality. The illustration here is a star. It, it has, uh, excuse me, is a square. And <clears throat> the central figure is a humanoid figure that is standing on the earth. The earth has a, an eyeball figure on it. it. It looks like an eye. And above the figure is the crescent moon. To the right of the figure is the sun with its sun rays. And there is a kind of pattern of stars that um, form one side of an X that connects each diagonal of the square. Um, on the left hand side of this figure is a sort of opening up of the <clears throat> psychic plane of the, of the world of this image. And it really, this X forms its node at the center of the figure who's standing on the earth. And so on one side, it expands off into stars and star fields. On the other hand, there's this revealing of these deeper layers and this layering of um, circles and spheres and spirals and things like that. And now back to the text. Holistic expressions of cosmos. The self is a mirror of the cosmic process. Spirit entered matter and becomes like nothing and transcends itself thereby generating creation. It comes to know itself through its process. The story of Christ is the story of enduring creation. The individual participates in that story because of its very existence. There are two paths it may take. First, it may follow the division of spirit into matter and onto death. Second, it may transcend matter and death in order to generate creativity and embrace the source spirit. The self-cherishing ego dies to self in an act of compassion, and the individual emerge a new being identified with divinity. The illustration here is uh, sun and moon. The sun on the left-hand side of the rectangle is radiating light. The crescent moon on the right-hand side of the rectangle, the frame of the illustration. In the center is the earth illuminated by the sun, and shadow on the moon side, and out of the earth grows a tree which has its various phases of life, the budding, the creating of fruits, and so on and so forth. And so back to the text, self as ma spirit manifest. The individual is a spark of divinity, an original manifestation of spirit, whose history may be traced back to the moment spirit decided to divide itself into matter in order to know itself. The individual spirit inhabits several vessels and vitalizes them in their utilization. Although the vessels are usually referred to as distinct bodies, they are actually a single spectrum of interrelated phenomenon. There are three vehicles through which our spirit manifests and two vessels in which it resides. Each vehicle has a specific world or plane that it is unique to. Here, the illustration is in a rectangle, and it is a rectangle that is divided into the left and right side. The center of the rectangle has a sort of double helix kind of boundary. On the left-hand side, we have the earth and there is a humanoid form. There are circles on each of the chakra points, and surrounding this form is sort of energy radiation, patterns of energy radiation. And the energy radiation seems to emerge out of the figure's crown and third eye chakra and goes into and over into the right-hand side of the figure and connects it directly with the wings of an angelic figure. This is a flying humanoid figure. And this uh, figure is flying in that sort of a world where it's bubbles, there's a lot of frothing energy, there's circles superimposed on one another, and it, this figure is flying through that. <clears throat> now back to the text on vehicles. The first and foremost, the first and most familiar vehicle is the physical body. Most perception is structured by the form of the physical body. It is obviously utilized in physical motion and exercise. Its world is that of matter. 
The second is the energetic body. It is closely related to the physical. Its perceptions involve some emotion, intuition, and extrasensory. We directly perceive it through the activities of our chakras. It is the hidden force behind many physical and extra-physical actions. Many paranormal phenomena such as telepathy or healing occur through this body. It is strengthened specifically through energetic meditation and generally through our mode of interaction with the world. It, its world is that of energy, the hidden aspect of matter. Third is the astral body. The astral body is not actually a single body. Rather, it is many and stacked like Russian dolls. It denotes the vehicle used within consciousness itself, whether individual, collective, or cosmic. There are many layers of spirit, and each requires its own vehicle. Most obviously, the astral body is used in dreaming. Material space-time is not its natural world, so it may detach from the physical-slash-energetic bodies and enter the vast world of consciousness. It is developed through meditation, dream work, and astral projection. Vessels. The primal spirit resides in two vessels within every individual, which form a divine ratio. First, spirit resides in the eternal now, the ever-present general act of observation. It is given to every being and cannot change. Second, spirit resides in the intellect, which may be regarded as the agent of causation within the various bodies. It's, it is consists in the synthesis of knowledge and volition. It operates each body through regulating their perception of the cosmos and determining responses and activity through intention. It may change through time and outside of time. It is equivalent to the immortal soul and reincarnates into matter until divine identity is realized. The illustration here um, is a figure standing on earth um, and there is a shadow cast there is a sun, but it is a dark sun, actually, and it looks to be in the form of an eye. So there's an eye with a solar solar uh, sun experience as a pupil casting light onto this figure that is standing on an abstract earth. So back to the text. Experience as perception. Experience is perception and consciousness. It is the relationship of particular things and events with the eternal observer. Perception divides into form and content. Content is sensation through any of the bodies, such as sight through eyes, emotion through the subconscious, clairvoyance through the chakras. Form is the intellect's manifestation in the respective plane such as theory for the physical, personality for the subconscious, archetype for the collective unconscious, and beyond. When a vehicle is neglected, experience is ignored. Most people must actively strengthen their energetic and astral bodies before they experience the extrasensory realms. The illustration here is a bounded rectangle, on the left side of which is the sun, with its rays and radiant, the center of this rectangle, this frame, is a human face, an abstract human face, with the third eye active. And on the right-hand side, there is a sort of wall. So there's a projection experiencing happen from the sun, sending its rays through the third eye of this face, and those form a kind of kaleidoscopic image being projected on a what appears to be like a wall to the right-hand side of this image, and that has several different layers of circularity, of, and it seems almost as if it's a portal. Back to the text. Objectivity versus subjectivity. The questions of objectivity of events diminish as the modes of experience increase. The epistemological priority of objective occurrences loses meaning outside of Newtonian physics. Events must be completely subjective at a cosmic level. The illustration here is the Ouroboros, the snake eating its own tail. The snake itself has a star field on it. In the center of that circle is the Earth. And there is a human form with a telescope looking up at the star field Ouroboros. Back to the text, form and contents of events. 
The unfolding of occurrences may be divided into form and content. The content may be matter, energy, vitality, spirit, and so on. The form may be physical laws, energetic laws, karmic laws, and so on. A knowledge of these laws facilitates the discernment of reality. The illustration here is the Trinity knot. There is actually four circles in here. The lines surrounding and composing the Trinity knot, which is actually four circles in this case, looks to be like uh, the double helix of double helix of uh, DNA. The center image is a human form, and uh, the the whole helix, the, all the helixes, the uh, the lines of this knot uh, emerge out of the third eye. It surrounds the crescent moon, the sun in radiation, and the earth in these in this expression. So back to the text. Cosmic experience. The cosmos is infinitely more complex and deep than can be imagined. There are an indefinite number of planes, worlds, and beings. The individual is one of many. Consciousness spans the entirety. Cosmic infinitude is immediately accessible through our divine aspect. The individual is truly a microcosmic aspect of the microcosm. So here we have an illustration. It is a bounded illustration by a rectangle, um, in the center of which is the uh, figure of the earth, but it now has a face on it with eyes that are open. The, this is surrounded by a, the star field Ouroboros, the snake eating its tail with stars on top of it. There's nothing between the Ouroboros, um, which is representative of the stars, and the earth but outside of this star field ouroboros is many different layers of circle circularity this is the representative of the deeper world these different energy patterns and things like that back to the text we're now on the chapter for practice introduction to practice practice is the only way of development for the slow and steady There need not be moments of genius, inspiration, or incredible devotion. There need only be a deep desire to develop, to realize one's own divine nature. Slow steps of realization slowly transform the world from the material prison of the self to an open, luminous, beautiful, and compassionate occurrence. Daily practice is the manifestation of motivation, and its fruition is the realization of divine identity. The illustration here is, again, a bounded rectangle. It is framed by uh, the helical, kind of double helix DNA sort of experience. Each of the every other um, nodes of that spiral experience uh, is composed of a light and dark side. The light side has a circle drawn in, and it looks almost like eyes. Within the experience, this is very reminiscent of one of the first illustrations, is uh, a man who is walking down a path. The path goes along a hill and spirals up to a tree that is producing fruit. In the top left of the image is a radiant sun. So back to the text, meditation. Meditation is the heart of practice. It creates a physical arena in which the energetic, astral, and intellectual bodies may be encountered. Meditation takes several forms, concentration, analytic, and trance. Concentration strengthens the various vehicles and bodies, as well as increases the manifestation of the internal now, divine spirit. Analytic strengthens and expands the intellectual body. Trance strengthens the energetic and astral bodies while acting as gateways to those vehicles. The illustration here is unbounded. It is two figures sitting in meditation. There is a vortex of energy emerging from the crown chakras. The space in between the two figures is filled with that sort of superimposition of energy uh, signifiers and the different spheres representing the deeper realms of cosmic and divine identity. Back to the text on posture. 
physical posture is the foundation of meditation simply because we are opening up a physical space time through which to encounter the beyond. While many aspects of posture are a matter of taste and ability, there are two initial principles and two general poses. The first principle is that the spine must be straight in order to fully utilize the energetic body, which in turn vitalizes any astral or intellectual event. Second, the posture must be such that it may be held without much wavering or pain for the duration of the intended meditation. Otherwise, it becomes an obstacle rather than a means. The illustration here we're being presented with is that of sit-in meditation. There is the caduceus, actually, the wing caduceus, which is the uh, staff with the snakes twining up it and wings coming out of it. This is superimposed on the body of someone in seated, seated meditation. And so back to the text, sitting, po sitting pose. The first main pose is the seated pose. It is used in concentration and analytic meditations. One may sit cross-legged on the floor with a small cushion supporting the bottom. If possible, the knees should touch the floor to form two legs of a tripod. In order from least to most stable, the legs must be set one in front of the other. One foot may rest on the opposite side thigh or both feet on the opposite thigh. The physical body needs to be adapted to each pose, so begin with what is available and through daily practice work towards stability. One may also sit in a chair. The feet should make contact with the ground. The spine should be straight and not rest on the chair back. The hands may be folded in the lap or set on the knees. A specific mudra may be used depending on taste. Here are two illustrations of sitting posture, one to the left, which is the uh, half lotus posture with one foot in front of the other and a mudra right in front of the belly. And then the illustration on the right is that of sitting in a chair with spine straight away from the back of the chair, supported with the hands on the knees. Laying pose. The second main pose is the laying pose. It is used mostly in trance and in some analytic meditations. One should lie on the floor with minor padding under the whole body and a thin pillow to support the head. The spine should be straight. The arms should be relaxed several inches from the body and the palms may face up or down. The legs should be several inches apart and the feet relaxed. There's an illustration here of that posture. Um, again, with the pillow under the head, the hands are up in this illustration and the legs are nice and relaxed and the feet are released from any tension. Back to the text, concentration. Concentration is the foundation of most spiritual development. Many spiritual phenomena simply dissolve when one loses concentration. Phenomena must be held in relation to the intellect slash causal body in order for experience, creativity, and development to occur. When the relationship is relaxed, the subtle motions of spirit simply float away from real observation into fantasy and darkness, such that they lose their cause of being, which is the intellect. Concentration strengthens the intellect in itself, but also familiarizes it with itself, such that it may manifest more and more powerfully in perception. Sit Simply sit in this sitting posture and concentrate the mind on one object. The breath as it enters the nostril or in the pulsation of the stomach is generally chosen as the object. Concentration on the breath at those places has beneficial energetic responses. Here we have an illustration of that, which is in a bounded rectangle, um, bordering it off from the page. On the left-hand side, the sun is radiant in the... Uh, kind of middle is uh, an image of uh, an abstracted image of a face that is breathing. There are patterns of energy that are supporting kind of blowing up and out of the nose. And it is supporting an image of a face that is sort of floating in the expression of breath. And back to the text, analytic. The breath is a beautiful metaphor for a spiritual development. 
However, any object may be chosen. Some objects have specific effects on the various vehicles. For example, concentration on sounds such as mantra are immensely powerful. One may also concentrate on an image, works of holy art, a candle flame, one's own image in the mirror, and so on are particularly powerful. The mind will invariably wander and get caught up in fantasies. The work of concentration meditation is bringing the mind back and holding it there. The process of departure and return familiarizes the mind with itself, thereby facilitating its greater manifestation in perception. It should be performed every day for a period of time that is just longer than comfortable. The length of meditation should grow with the strength of concentration. Special attention and effort should be given to this meditation because it is the foundation of most other practices. And here is an illustration that is unbounded and simply on the page. It forms a dot. Surrounding the dot is a dotted circle, circumference of a circle. And then from there, there are the sort of spiral energy patterns that are associated with the breath and with energy surrounding the, the figures in the previous illustrations. This is really forming a kind of sense of breath and awareness around a, a circle that may or may not be directly perceived. Back to the text. Primal experience. An analytic meditation is a type of concentration meditation, the object of which is a mental construction. One may meditate on a statement, expression, or visualization. It is a direct transformation of the intellectual body through concentration on an intellectual object. The mind literally consumes the foreign object, grows to accommodate the material, and causes the objects to manifest in relation to spirit through direct experience. There are many analytic meditations and guidances, and guidance may be found in spiritual tradition. A unique variety of analytic meditation occurs when one attempts to use the functions of the higher vehicles for the first time. For example, when one attempts to consciously stimulate a chakra for the first time, one's under, one understands understanding must expand to embrace the existence of that chakra in order to create the cause of stimulation or even admit the chakra into perception. An analytic meditation on the chakra occurs until such understanding is assimilated into the intellect, be it through intuition, guidance, or sheer will. Here the illustration is bounded by a sense of uh, directional lines, <clears throat> like wedges, forms a long and skinny rectangle. On the left-hand side, there is the face that is in meditation with the exhalations of breath from the nostril. It is holding up an image of a face. The face, in turn, has an expression that comes out of the central part of the face, and it opens up the uh, field um, so that there are that sense of energetic superimposition of spheres that is often associated with spiritual experience in these illustrations. So... And now back to the text, trance. This is the chapter on trance. Here's the introduction. Trance acts as a gateway to the energetic and astral vehicles. It occurs in the laying posture. One must enter trance in order to transfer the intellectual consciousness from the physical to the higher vehicles. It occurs when the mind is awake, but the body is asleep. The body feels heavy and lightly paralyzed. A very similar state occurs when one goes to sleep, except that one's concentration disperses. However, the mind is active, clear, and expansive in trance. It will naturally occur when a state of deep physical relaxation occurs while the mind is held alert through an act of concentration. Simply enter the laying posture and begin a concentration meditation on the breath. Here we have uh, an illustration of trance that is in a bounded rectangle, the border of which is an alternating pattern of light and dark that is expanding in its cadence so that the, it's much darker above and lighter below. The, fig, the, the frame of this illustration is divided in two, the bottom half being kind of cross-hatched and dark. It's like lying on the earth. The top half is open. There is a human figure lying on this uh, horizon line, 
and there is a spiraling pattern at the heart. You can see the exhalation of breath through the nostrils, which is representing mindfulness meditation on the breath. And beneath the throat uh, <clears throat> is something that looks like an eye that is radiating up between the heart center and the crown center. And now back to the text. Experience. One must completely relax and may do so through a variety of means. One may systematically tense and relax the muscles of the body. One may systematically call to mind all the parts, all the body parts, imagining them flood with light and then release them to rest. One may visualize walking downstairs, taking an elevator, or hiking down a pleasant path. The means do not matter so long as a complete and deep relaxation occurs. Once the body is relaxed, hold the concentration on the breath. Trance will naturally emerge. One may recognize the completion of trance when one feels that the physical body is motionless and distinct, as if you may no longer directly feel and move it, but need to perform an intermediary action, such as calling the mind back to the eyes or twitching a finger. At first, one may feel fearful, as when one performs any act of spiritual development. It is simply a fear of the unknown compounded with this fear of the limited self. Spiritual development effectively destroys the present limited self, or rather the egoistic self-perception, because it is transcended through emergent phenomena and primal experience. Here there is an illustration. It is a wide and skinny rectangle. On the left hand, there is a small circle, and it is connected to a larger circle and a larger circle, and then finally a circle that is only halfway shown at the furthest right hand side of the illustration. And between those circles is, is complete blackness. Um, and so there's this sort of wedge experience uh, with the left-hand side. Um, there's this sort of dotted kind of field that is being pierced by this, this um, tube or this, this triangle or wedge of, of dark that is punctuated by these light spheres. Back to the text. Energetic action. This is the chapter on energetic action. Introduction. Just as the physical body consumes, transforms, and moves in matter, the energetic body does so in energy. Energy fills the cosmos. It surrounds us as an essential aspect of matter, but also in vibrations as a medium of cosmic consciousness. We experience and use such energy directly whenever we manipulate the energy body or indirectly through using the physical or astral bodies because their actions require vitality. The energetic body is just as complex and miraculous as the physical. Although there is a staggering complexity, three genera generalizations may be made. The illustration here is within a frame of a rectangle that has a kind of diagonal dashed pattern to it. The bottom of that frame of this illustration is a, an abstracted form of the earth upon which uh, there are three figures. The central figure is uh, composed of dotted and dashed lines that are representative of the energetic auras. There are points within the uh, chakra points, different symbols. On the left hand of this figure is a uh, humanoid, uh, complete kind of physical body walking. And then on the other side of the energy body is this, uh, this humanoid figure, but instead of arms, it has uh, angel wings. Back to the text. Three ideas. First, the energetic body consumes and expels vitality just as the physical body. Its health and activity determines the amount of energy consumed and used. Just as the body can and cannot eat certain foods, the energetic body thrives on some and is poisoned by others. Second, the energetic body responds to intention just as the physical body. The volition travels directly through the necessary organs to, to produce emotion. The necessities of our environment trained us to use our physical organs. However, we rarely exercised 
are energetic organs. Consequently, when we first try to perform an energetic action, the volition is dispersed in the confused and incoherent motions of that body. Third, the energetic body possesses definite organs that perform definite functions. These organs are the chakras. They are occasionally but directly sensible as centers of energy on the surface of the body. One may become proficient in their youth through practice. The chakras grow and strengthen through repeated use. There is an illustration here. It is of uh, a stream coming from uh, hills and going into the ocean. Right at the intersection of the land and the ocean uh, stands the sun. Just above it, it's like a sunset or a sunrise, and the sun is radiating its light. Back to the text, tools, one of the tools being intention. Just as the physical body has arms and legs that may be used as tools for various purposes, the energetic body has components that may be used as tools. The primary tool is not really a tool. It is intention. The energetic body is so elastic and connected with higher consciousness that it immediately responds to intention and helps the operator learn how to manifest intention, if not actually perform the activity at that time. Concentration helps to define and hold one's intention. The illustration here is bounded by a border that goes from dark to dotted to light over and over again. In the bottom left of the frame is uh, the earth that has a waterway being shown. On the earth is standing a physical form of a human that is surrounded by the energy vibration patterns, the lines and dashes. There uh, there are stars in the sky. Um, From the energy body, the aura that is demarked by the uh, rhythmic markings, there seems to be two hands or arms extending. Those arms uh, seem to open up a um, portal within the star field. And this sort of looks almost like a yoni, a sort of vesica Pisces shape. And in that view, you can see the superimposo- superimposed circles, the dashes that represent this higher spiritual experience. Back to the text. Egg sphere. The spiritual world is as diverse or more than the physical, with beings and forms that inhabit a continuum from light to, to, to dark. While some beings are benevolent, some are so foreign to humanity that they may damage us in any interaction, like we would with a fragile butterfly, and some beings are actually ma- malevolent. The energy body has a natural mechanism of self-protection. It creates a sphere of energy, rotating from head to toe. It holds the various vehicles within itself as the yolk of an egg holds its embryo. Nothing may pass through it without the permission of the individual. Most people never have interactions with spiritual beings because, besides the obvious atrophy of the energetic organs, they never invite or permit such beings to pass that barrier. The action and boundary of the sphere is directly sensible when one is completely startled by an unexpected event. The heart chakra immediately releases a vast amount of energy into it. If one is observant, the pouring forth and redirection into the sphere's orbit is sensible. Here we have an illustration of a human form. There is energy coming out of the crown chakra that forms a sphere around it, and then there are sort of uh, energy, energy arrows that are indicating the rotation of the sphere. So back to the text, communication. In our physical world, life expands everywhere it can. So too with the spiritual world. We have developed communities of humans, and we may communicate with the animals on some levels. So too with the spiritual world. There are communities and hierarchies of spiritual beings of which one is a member. One may access a wealth of information, assistance, and camaraderie through the community. If one desires to participate in the greater spiritual community, as is natural, one must open up to it and the possibilities of communication. 
Beginning the communication is as simple as setting the intention to allow and invite communication with those beings who share the path of realizing divine identity. Communication may be as simple as a clear and quiet voice in one's inner dialogue, or as complex as a tutor-student relationship carried on through many dreams and meditations. The communicator may simply be a personification of the individual subconscious, the activity of a collective archetype, or one of the infinitely diverse spiritual beings. Here we have a bounded illustration. It is a wide and skinny rectangle, the boundary of which has a strongly alternating pattern of light and dark. Um, and it is the image itself is composed of superimposed circles and spheres representing this depth of spiritual experience. And in those spheres are a variety of beings, mostly humanoid, some just circles and some with wings. Discernment, back to the text, discernment. As with physical relationships, one must discern the intention of the other. The energetic body resonates with those who share its intention and diminishes in the presence of contrary energies. However, if one is unacquainted with one's own energy, it is very difficult to discern the intentions of another. It is extremely important to judge information on its own merit and not give it credence merely because it comes from a spiritual source. It is likewise important to judge any spiritual interaction on its effect on the various vehicles and the development of as a whole. So here we have uh, an inter uh, illustration. It is unbounded. There is no frame around it. In the center of it is an abstracted human face. To the left of this face, there is a dark sphere that has wedges of energy or lightness coming in. There are layers of um, rhythmic, rhythmic energy, it looks like. On the right-hand side, there is a radiating sun with a similar pattern of energy, the wave-like energy, kind of concentric spheres. This is reminiscent of the, the angel and the demon on the shoulder or something like that. <clears throat> Back to the text. Metabolism. The energy body consumes and uses energy of various types. It has a metabolism and naturally consumes sufficient energy as according to its use. Likewise, it expends energy according to its use. It provides the vitality necessary for both physical and astral actions. Consequently, it is intimately connected with those planes and its metabolism, including its collection of energy, is influenced by daily events and actions. It degrades and depletes in the presence of negativity and sin. When the self is plagued by the consequences of wrong action, its guilt causes energetic completion depletion, and impurity. Spiritual development requires as much energy as the metabolism can provide. Depleted and impure energies will obviously slow or prevent any development. The individual must stop the cause of wrong action, then purify and restore the lost energy. If the action is not stopped, purification activity is in vain. So here we have uh, two images. Again, it's an it's a illustration that is unbounded and unframed. On the left is a human figure um, looking to be standing or lying down, similarly to the right. On the left-hand side, there are wedges of energy, kind of triangular, curved triangular forms, and these are light, and they are surrounding the energy field. The energy field is marked by rhythmic patterns or marks um, that are dense. Towards the right, there is a sense, more of a sense of dispersion of the marks that demark the, the aura. And the, there are also this sort of triangular, curved triangular wedge shape patterns, but these are dark. Back to the text. Purification. <clears throat> There are many ways to purify and restore energy. The simplest is an exercise with the breath, which may be performed in the concentration meditation or in everyday activity. One imagines that clean, white, vital energy enters the body with the in-breath and spreads throughout. The clean energy displaces the dark and pure energies, which are released with the out-breath. 
Here is an illustration. It is the sacred geometric form of the Vesica Pisces, which is two intersecting circles to form that sort of yoni or oval shape in the middle. The left circle is an image of the earth. The right circle has concentric circular patterns that are representative of the spirit world and the energetic world. And in between, we have the representation of the human energy body in the form of the chakra points and the aura. Back to the text. Activity. Just as the physical body has exercises and postures that are conducive to spiritual growth, the energetic body has practices and postures. They are performed through meditation or trance in either lying or sitting posture, depending on the energetic practice. Stimulation. So here is uh, an image of the sun. It is very radiant. This illustration is unbounded in an open space. Towards the right is uh, an image of the earth surrounded by what uh, we've seen before in the egg sphere, that, that sphere uh, that surrounds the energy body and protection. This looks somewhat like a magnetic field. And there is also the sort of curved breath-like pattern of uh, energy coming from the sun and holding up the earth. Back to the text, stimulation. The first practice is the direct stimulation of the energetic body and its organs. The process is analogous to the relaxation exercise before trance, in which one holds each muscle group in attention, flexes it, and then releases. Rather than flexing, simply invite that part of the energetic body to stimulate and become luminous. Direct perception of the energetic body is difficult at first because it is generally atrophied and acknowledged by culture in a vague, pluralistic sense rather than in its definite complexity. One may avoid this difficulty by energetically stimulating parts of the physical body. The energetic body is thereby strengthened because of its intimate relation with the physical and will eventually display its unique organs to perception. Here we have a bounded uh, framed illustration of a figure at rest. The frame of the illustration is a uh, line, the border of it is, with this sort of uh, triangular triangles kind of hanging off of it. Um, <clears throat> the form that is the human form that is lying down in this illustration has two tubes. Uh, coming out of its body. One comes from the crown chakra and one comes from the back and they almost meet underneath the uh, throat chakra. And then on top of the image floating above it are six stars, each of which have sort of energy lines going up above it and radiating this sort of atmosphere of energy that is reminiscent of the illustrations of the human aura. Now back to the text centering. One may encourage the energetic body to enter into a greater relation with its environment. It may connect directly with the vast systems of the earth and the air similar to a tree. This practice purifies the body and the energy around it while increasing its daily metabolism. Sit in the meditation posture. Allow the energetic sphere to envelop the body like an egg. Directly stimulate the base chakra at the tailbone and give it energy. Imagine that the energy stretches downward until it makes contact with the earth, like the root of a tree. Do the same for the crown chakra at the top of the head, stretching the energy upward to form the branches. Allow energy to flow through you from the earth and the sky. It will do so as naturally as water, as water is raised to the leaves of the tree. So here we have a square illustration that is framed by a pattern of alternating uh, lines and circles that is reminiscent of the DNA spiral. And here we see someone sitting in the meditation posture with the roots of a tree merging out of the tail tailbone, the, the root chakra, and the branches of the tree emerging up out of the crown with the um, egg or the sphere surrounding him. Back to the text. Tree-like growth. Initially, the tree will be a sapling. Invite it to grow, using the energy stored in the surrounding sphere. Rather, invite the sphere 
to transform itself through the branching of the tree. Let it follow the natural course of energy. Hold the growth of the tree and its energy transformations as an object of the concentration meditation. It may help to unite the cycle of breath with its growth and motion. <clears throat> Here we have an illustration. It is a square and bounded illustration with a border that's very similar to the one before, except that now the circles are filled in. The image itself is divided in two by the central line. There is the, the central line is illustrated by the tree. So um, the bottom of the illustration, the square, has uh, an abstract version of the earth. There is, the center of the earth is dark, and you can see the crust of the earth with water and continents on it. Sitting on top of that is a, a person in sit, sitting meditation posture. You can see the roots of the tree growing from the base chakra. You can see the branches of the tree growing up out of the crown. On the left-hand side, there is the crescent moon. On the right-hand side, there is the radiant sun. There is a sort of sack of energy that is floating around the person in sitting meditation. And now back to the text. Self for others. The Buddhists have a unique practice that provides a deep connection with fellow sentient beings and powerfully purifies one's own energy. The practice is called self for others. It may be easily performed in sitting meditation as well as in the everyday, like the luminous breath practice. It consists of three parts analogous to the breath, the inhale, the holding, and the exhale. First, call to mind the suffering of another, may many or all sentient beings. Imagine that it rises from their body like black smoke. Decide that you will remove this suffering and the causes of suffering. Inhale the smoke, pulling it in from their body. They are immediate, immensely relieved. The smoke, along with their suffering and its causes, enters your body. Here we have an illustration. It is a bounded illustration. It's rectangular in form. It is, has a dark border, but there is, again, a sense of DNA spiral to it. There is... Uh, someone sitting in a meditation posture with eyes closed. At the center of this being is a dark circle. There is a V-shaped uh, path of energy coming up and out of its, um, sh its crown chakra, and these are the marked with the lines similar to that of breath. Uh, surrounding this sitting feet, uh, sitting a meditator is many, many people, and they have this sort of um, squiggle lines coming up and out of them that represent perhaps the darkness, that smoke, that is being directed in by the intentional breath of the meditator. Back to the text. Second, call to mind your self-cherishing heart. Imagine that this limited ego is like a sphere of dark coal in your heart. When you inhale... When the inhale is completed, the smoke and the coal unite. In the single moment that it takes the inhale to become the exhale, imagine that the darkness annihilates one an the darknesses annihilate one another in a luminous explosion. Once again, in the single moment that it takes to inhale takes the inhale to become the exhale, imagine that the darknesses annihilate one another in a luminous explosion. Your heart is now the heart of an enlightened activity luminous like the sun. Third and finally, decide that with your new heart, you will provide those beings happiness and its causes. Let the joyous luminosity emanate from your heart and into theirs with your exhale. So now we have the same illustration, but the border is much, much lighter. There is a sense of radiance like the sun emerging from a circle in the meditator's heart. There is joy and a sense of dance almost with the beings that are surrounding the meditator. Back to the text. We are now on the chapter called Astral Action. Astral Action. Introduction. Astral projection occurs when the astral vehicle separates from the physical, much like in particularly clear dreams. The vehicle may enter the astral body at many different levels, of which the astral 
analog of our physical world is merely one. It will naturally come to rest with the level with which it most resonates. So it is immensely important to charge the vehicle with pure motivation. It is a powerful means of spiritual development and the training utilizes many practices. The practice is very simple. Lay in trance and induce the astral body to separate through a technique. The techniques vary according to taste. Projection may even be induced by an act of sheer will. However, a technique will utilize the energetic body in a simple and straightforward manner. So here we have a, an illustration of astral projection. It is a bounded and framed rectangle. There is a diagonal pattern uh, in the, the frame of the illustration. So there are dark triangle, light triangle, dark triangle, light triangle, composing the, that border. The illustration is divided into ground and sky, and there is a human form lying on the ground. Um, there are tubes of energy, it seems, coming from the crown chakra and the third eye, and uh, the tube comes up and out of the out of the face and crown chakra and becomes the the arms of a figure that has wings and that is flying. The, those tubes also continue from the crown chakra in an opposite direction down into the earth to surround an eye that is underneath the uh, lying down figure. At the top right of the illustration is the crescent moon. Back to the text. Emergence. Vibration. There are two stereotypical sensations or symptoms of the process which are felt after trance. First, vibrations will be felt. The vibrations will vary according to individual, but they are always reported to be strong enough to break the trance of those who don't expect them. There is a deep roaring, like that of the seaside, and high-pitched resonances, like the trills of a phone modem. The vibrations must embrace the totality of vehicles for the process to continue. Here we have an illustration that is bounded um, by a border that is specked with dots, that has a sort of alternating pattern. In the image, there are many, many uh, double helixes. There are concentric circles. There are patterns of uh, lines here and there. And it is barely discernible, but there is a human form in the center, the center of uh, the center line of this image above the crown chakra. There is a radiating uh, concentric circle. And within the, within the human form, there is a staff that goes from the third eye all the way down to the base of the spine. And around that form, this sort of alternating double helix pattern that is very reminiscent of the caduceus, the, the serpents twining the staff, which some people see as representative of the kundalini energy is rising up through the body. And now back to the text. Barrier. Second, a passing through must be felt. This sensation is generally very brief and forgettable, but it may act as a barrier for the beginner. It may be thought of as passing through the space between atoms or over the boundary between the everyday and the spiritual worlds or lifting out of body. The barrier itself has a certain amount of gravity, such as such that those inexperienced or fearful will be attracted near it. It is full of droplets of darkness, which are not malevolent, but will attach to the astral vehicle and keep it near the physical body until enough fear builds that the individual will intend to return to the physical. One must put enough pressure on the astral vehicle while it is in the vibrations in order to propel it through the border. One must either hold a strong motivation or learn energetic techniques. A motivation to enjoy the sensation of separation and freedom of motion is sufficient. One may recognize that one passed through when the vibrations are no longer physically felt, as if one became in tune with the cosmic sways and now lacks a distinct point of reference by which to measure their magnitude. Here we have a, an illustration uh, that is unbounded. It is on the open page. There, the central figure is that of a circle. There is a kind of crescent moon actually to it, but instead of a luminous 
uh, thumbnail type uh, moon. It is divided in bands of light and dark. And instead of a darkness, sort of dark side of the moon, there is uh, the overlapping superimposed circles that are representative of the spirit world here in this book. Surrounding um, this is the sort of spiraled kind of breath markings uh, around it. <clears throat> and so back to the text, techniques. Any technique may be employed after trance to induce the vibrational state and propel the astral vehicle to pass through it. Both the vibrations and projection will naturally occur in the proper conditions. The trick is to identify those conditions. Some imagine that they are floating above their body and that they desire actually to do it. Some stimulate the chakras and imagine that the crown or third eye opens and then they pass through it. Some imagine pulling themselves out with their arms. The entire process may take upwards to 30 minutes, which feels immensely long. One must be patient and use concentration to maintain both a strong intention and the imagination exercise. Here we have a framed image. Uh, again, it is um, this alternating pattern of light and dark in the border. Again, it is this human form lying on the earth. Uh, you can see that the heart chakra is active. You can see that there is an eye underneath the heart chakra, underneath the body. In between the crown and third eye extends one leg of a ladder, and from the throat extends another. This ladder then goes to the crescent moon that is above the body, and there is a sense of energy in uh, dashed, dashed markings that... Uh, float above the body and also up and up the ladder as if it is almost climbing up and out. Back to the text, memory. The final step is reintegration of memories of projection. Cognition of astral activity does not use the everyday brain patterns associated with physical experience. The same challenges face astral projection memory as dream memory. It is the reason why projection seems unfamiliar or esoteric. There are a variety of solutions such as setting intention, encoding experience into a story pattern, or expressing it in a journal. Here we have an illustration. It is a bounded illustration framed by a simple line with um, directional kind of um, hash markings. Uh, the Most of the figure actually is... Uh, that superimposed um, circular energy uh, description of the spirit world. There are circles in which there are um, angelic forms with wings. And the main action of this illustration, the main point of this illustration, is uh, a humanoid figure walking. And there are these sorts of cones or lines of vision coming out from the human figure walking to the right, um, and these, these cones of envision kind of extend to look at the entire frame of the right side of the illustration rectangle. Nothing is in, there is nothing drawn within uh, one of the triangles or cones of vision. And then there is a boundary experience between the nothingness that this being is seeing in the spirit world. And there are some dots and some expressions of the overlapping circles. But then all around this figure is the spirit or astral world. Back to the text. We are now on the chapter of dreaming. Dreaming. Lucid. Dreaming is the natural occurring arena of energetic and astral activity. The energetic body naturally expands and performs metabolism. The astral vehicle naturally separates and enters the astral plane at its resonant level. Dream experience is naturally integrated with subconscious memory. Becoming conscious or lucid in a dream is an excellent means to utilize the astral vehicle for conscious development. However, it is a powerful means to manifest and experience unfulfilled desires, both subconscious and conscious. The experience will be developmental in proportion to the purity of motivation. So we have the illustration here of the um, body in trance. 
There is the extension of the tubes of energy from the third eye to the wings of the astral double, which is represented as the um, human figure with the angel wings. Um, surrounding this, uh, there are these sorts of rectangles that emerge from the foot of the being and form this sort of like, it looks like the walls of a cave. And it's the same image. It's a circle with a sort of cross hatching behind it. <clears throat> and now back to the text, practical. A slower path may be taken in the dream world in which the dreamer's ability and purity of intention may grow side by side. I call these means practical dreaming. One simply awakens to the fact that real spiritual activity can occur in dreams and consciously invites an interaction with the greater spiritual community for the realization of divine identity in self and others while resolving to integrate the dream memories with the consciousness. It allows the subconscious mind to guide the development of the conscious self in moderate spiritual development and participation. Practical dreaming has three steps, intellectual openness to the reality of dreams, energetic intention, and memory reintegration. So the illustration here is very similar. It is the body lying down with the astral double coming out, connected to the third eye through the wings. And there is a, um, uh, what seems to be a stacking of concentric circles that are sort of displaced, almost like a tube or tunnel of circles that this astral double will fly through. Back to the text. Intellectual action. One must intellectually accept that dreams may be real events in the greater spiritual world and not just subjective motions isolated within an individual mind. Acceptance is difficult because many dreams are obviously isolated fantasy. Realize that science has not yet provided a complete theory of dreams. Acknowledge that precognitive and telepathic dreams do occur. Observe the quality and depth of your own dreams. Notice any physical or energetic symptoms of particularly clear, meaningful, or long dreams, such as a sense of reality, directly waking up into the physical body, or a transformation from a fantasy dream. Eventually, the intellect will, with acknowledgement, eventually the intellect will acknowledge the possibility and will allow spiritual dreams to emerge as phenomena within perception. And so we have an unbounded image. It is on the open page. There is a uh, human form that has wings for arms. There are uh, triangles kind of bursting out, uh, sort of a sun ray burst of experience. There is the energy sphere that uh, the, the illustration that is characteristic of the sphere of energy that surrounds us. And uh, then finally, surrounding this are the expressions of uh, breath, those sort of spiral patterns um, that float, that cause these things to float. So back to the text. Invitation to community. One must invite spiritual development and community occur through the dreams. Otherwise, the natural energetic boundary will isolate the dreamer. The invitation must be tied to purity of motivation. It must be an expansion and elaboration of the cosmic processes of the individual, those of divine identification or manifestation of truth, beauty, or compassion. Otherwise, the baser and thoughtless desires may cause the astral vehicle to resonate with the lower realms and their inhabitants. So we have another illustration. It is unbounded without a border. It is characterized by the sense of spheres, sense of uh, overlapping spheres. There are um, some spheres that have <clears throat> the astral double, the human form with the angel wings, and there are a few that have uh, the spheres, the circles have something like portals within them. The whole thing is surrounded by the spiral activity that is often associated with breath in these illustrations. And now back to the text. Memory. 
Finally, the dream memories must be reintegrated into the everyday consciousness. It helps to recall that every day, that every dream may be a greater spiritual occurrence. One may keep a journal or spend the first few waking minutes reliving the dream. Sometimes a dream is so exotic or powerful that it must filter through the subconscious before it reaches the consciousness. The subconscious may overlay fantasy-like images and storylines over the events, which must then be analyzed. It may feed the dream piecemeal to the everyday consciousness through images, deja vu, intuition, and so on. A simple awareness of this possibility and the desire to hear such messages will eventually unfold the dream. So here we have an illustration. It is bounded and it is the border is characterized by triangles. And these triangles actually extend up and out of the uh, frame. And so it's sort of spiky almost. The main action of this uh, illustration is a figure walking on the earth. Within the earth, there is the sense of overlapping and superimposed circles that represent the spirit world. There is a flower that uh, seems to have roots to both the physical uh, the physical earth and also the, um, the overlapping circle spirit earth. The top right is a radiant sun. Back to the text. Epilogue. The limitation of experience, which is ignorance, is the cause of suffering. The world is a prison of self for one in the prison of self. The world will starve to death in the prison of self. The self will starve to death in the prison of self. Our true nature is freedom. Perception only admits emerged phenomenon, but true experience is emergent. We'll, uh, we will emerge from our prison and become the world. We are more than we appear. We are divinity. We are. So thank you for joining me on this journey to realize divine identity. I hope that you have connected in with yourself when that this experience has opened some thoughts, feelings, or commitments within you. It is really a beautiful thing to realize that this prison of self is only a, an illusion and that we really actually are completely free, that we have these incredible spiritual capacities, that we have the capacity to identify with divinity, to identify with this world and to make choices based in that. So th really the invitation is to engage in these practices so that you can embody greater peace, love, and unity consciousness to be present here and now on the earth to be of benefit to yourself and those around you. Thank you for engaging in this journey. Thank you for doing this work. And thank you for being yourself.